everyone. Welcome to today's Accelerate Your Performance podcast. I'm your host, Janet Pilcher. Thanks for having a desire to be your best at work and help your organization achieve success. This podcast is all about actions we can take to improve workplace culture and achieve results. And they're all aligned to our nine principles for organizational excellence. Let's jump in to today's episode. I'm so excited to introduce you to our guest, Max Bobbitt. Max is currently enrolled in our Teacher Ready Teaching Certification Program, and he's almost halfway through. In March, Max and his wife, Keisha, who live in Brussels, Belgium, invited a Ukrainian refugee family into their home. A mother, along with her daughters, whose ages are 14 and 10. The mother's name is Kaisosha, and her daughters are Masha and Polina. They've been staying in Max's family for the past eight weeks. Kasosha and her daughters arrived with a small amount of luggage after leaving her husband, Mikhail, behind in Kharkiv, Ukraine, where he is currently sheltering. She and Mikhail are both professors of law at the National University of International Affairs in Kharkiv. Max tells us she and her husband talk every day. We've learned about Max and his wife taking this family into their home and what they've done to help them. And we are inspired by their greatest generosity and kindness. We've invited Max on the show today to share his story with us, to share a bit more about Max. He currently teaches at the International School of Brussels, where he does English language development and helps coordinate for the International Baccalaureate Program. After he completes the Teacher Ready program, Max's goal is to teach middle school and high school general science and biology. Our podcast producer, Mary Stackhouse Consoli, caught up with Max to hear his story. So take a listen. I know you're going to enjoy it. Max, welcome to the show. We are thrilled that you're here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, let's just jump right in. We'd love for you to share a little bit about your background with us and where you grew up, what led you to Belgium, where you're now pursuing a career in education. So um, I'm an, I was an army brat, so I was born in Germany, actually, but both my parents are Americans. And um, I think that's probably what eventually led me to be in Belgium. It, it led me out of the United States because I was I had an early exposure to the world outside the U.S. But we bounced around a lot when I was really young, but most of my childhood was spent in Northern Virginia in the suburbs of D.C. And then I went down to school to, in Wilmington, North Carolina, and then um, to university there. I bounced around a little bit. I went back to D.C. and worked in policy in D.C. I met my future wife in D.C. She's Polish. Uh, but, but she moved back to Poland, and then, um, and then I kind of didn't like what I was doing, so I, I went to visit her in Poland, and I realized that I really liked her a lot. So I, I decided to move out there, and we moved out. I moved out there. She was already there in Warsaw, Poland. So I had been working in policy before that, mostly policy. I studied biology. At that point, I only had a bachelor's degree, and, and it was in biology. Uh, but I've never worked in biology. I did policy in D.C., and then I um, sort of did a little policy in, in Poland. But then I started teaching English uh, at like a language school, and that, that was my first exposure to teaching. I decided to get a master's degree in environmental protection in Warsaw, and in the middle of that, my wife uh, got a job that she couldn't refuse in Brussels. So we are in Brussels, Belgium now, which is across the across Europe from Poland. So she moved. So she moved to Poland, and then I we spent a year with me doing my master's degree in Warsaw, and then her living here, and then uh, and then I finished and moved here. So my master's was in environmental protection, and then I continued to work really in policy until our daughter was born three years ago, and then when she was born. I stopped working and stayed at home with her for a few months. When it was time for her to go into like uh, daycare, I didn't want to continue what I was doing. So, and I knew I knew that I had taught before, and I figured why not see what happens there. I don't know. I, I really liked my child, and I started to like being around children. If that sounds if that makes any sense. So. Uh, there's an international school, like literally, uh, like a mile and a half from where we live, and I went and I just sent my application. I said, "Hey, will you hire me? I'll I'll substitute teach. I'll do whatever." And they they needed substitute teachers, and I started substituting. So starting last school year, to 2020 to 2021, I was um, doing learning support in this international school. So I was like, "Okay, this is something that I want to really do as a career 
like as a second career. So yeah, I looked into options. I can't really, I don't speak enough. My French isn't good enough to do a course here and I wouldn't be able to fit in time to do a full-time course here. I'd, I had to work. So one of my buddies who was teaching psychology at the school, uh, he had already done the teacher ready program and he suggested that. So I looked into it and I said, okay, why not? Now I have to ask, would you be teaching in English? So yeah, the primary education, like primary language of education is English. However, um, since we're in uh, Brussels, the, the local students that aren't like international student kids, they either speak French or Dutch. So uh, depending on their levels of English, they, could, they get put into these programs where it's like half English, half French. Uh, and so now what I'm doing is Eng English language development. Also, you know, I have, the, I have my science background, so I'm in uh, science classes co-teaching. So there's a science teacher and I'm sort of helping with the students that are in my English language development classes and I'm sort of assisting with their education in science and in social studies. So it's really perfect because like it's basically student teaching but I'm getting paid to do it. <laughs> so it's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing about that and how you got to Belgium. And recently you shared with us that you connected with um, the Ukrainian mother and her daughters, Masha and Polina, that are currently staying with your family. How did you get connected? Okay, so you, yeah, you guys, um, <laughs> I have to say this. Uh, I'm probably one of the worst teacher ready students uh, that you guys have because I um, am continually late. I, I procrastinate on every assignment. And it's the the reason you know that I have a Ukrainian family living with us was because I was using it as a, a reason, not an excuse, for being late with one of my lessons. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so that, that, that has to be that has to be said. <laughs> but they uh, the the woman, the mother, is good friends with my wife. They went to they went to law school together in Chicago, and they've known each other for fifteen years now, something like that. And um, we knew. I mean, you know, we've I've we visited them in Ukraine like ten years ago. Um, and, uh, we knew when the, when Russia invaded that, you know, I don't, they might not have had the full information because I, they, you know, their state run media doesn't really tell them everything. Even the Ukrainian state run media isn't very forthright with information. So it seemed like we had a little bit better idea of what was going on than they did and it didn't look good. So we let them know, we said, Hey, look, just to let you know, we're here. And if you need us, we'll come get you Poland borders, Ukraine. And I know Poland well, I speak Polish. And I could, I, I said, you know, I'll come get you. I'll come to the Polish border if you can get there. So it's the mother, the father, and the two daughters. And they had been sheltering in place, basically, in their apartment for two weeks. They couldn't go out, except um, wow. it was like, it was basically like the pandemic, except instead of a deadly virus, there were bombs going around that could kill you. Mm -hmm. um, and so they could only go out, like, at certain hours during the day to do bare essential shopping. And they wouldn't want to go out otherwise, because, right. like, I mean, it's a war. It's war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was getting pretty pretty bad, and they so she she wrote finally and said, "Hey, I'm coming," and we said, "Great." And so it took wow. it literally it took them. We I didn't even have to go to Poland. The European Union, so Belgium and Poland and a bunch of other countries are in the European Union, which is a confederation of countries, you know, in Europe that not all European countries are in, but but they are. And so as soon as they they could ride on trains to the to the to the border of Poland, of Ukraine, Ukraine and Poland. And then as soon as they got into Poland, the European Union has allowed any Ukrainian national to travel by, by train anywhere uh, in Europe. So they got into Poland and then they just hopped on trains for free all the way across Europe to Belgium, which is, um, it's above, it, we're right above France, right between France and Netherlands and Germany and the, the UK. So it's like on the other side of Europe. Wow. Like so Kushia Kush and her daughters came into your home about nine weeks ago. Um, what yeah. what has it been like hosting them during this difficult time? You know, was it challenging to help them transition there? And also, uh, are there any anything that you'd like to share with us? Any memorable moments and times that you guys have had? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, we don't have a very large house. So we had to, we had a bedroom dedicated to our daughter, our three-year-old, which is now where mom lives, the mom lives. And we had a spare bedroom that the, that the two daughters live in. They're 10 and 14, so they share the bedroom. So it's, it's a tight house. It's like, you know, <laughs> packed living. But uh, it, it's been okay. It's been all right. We don't... Um, I was just saying before the broadcast that I haven't... Ha this is the first time I've been alone in maybe, I don't know, three weeks. They're all out at dinner right now, and I, I had to stay behind to record this podcast, which is good. I'm, I'm happy. Good. <laughs> I'm, We're glad I'm relishing you're with my us. alone time. Thank you. 
but yeah, no, my memorable moments. I, you know, I, I think it's been really fun. The transition, I, I can't imagine what it's been like, you know, they're, but they're, we've tried to be gracious with them. They're not, you know, they're at their war refugees, but they're not, I know people here, colleagues that teach at the school who um, have signed up to take refugees. And these are strangers that have come into their house. They don't, and some of them don't speak a word of English. So I know people who are, that are in much different situations than we are. We know these people, we're good friends with them. As soon as they arrived, there was no issue of like, oh, can we trust them to be in the house alone? No, there was no issue with that. I gave them a key. I said, hey, this is our house. Our house is your house. You can eat our food. I mean, my parents told friends of theirs at church back home. And I think you guys shared on social media that I had, I had set up a PayPal like fundraiser thing. I did this just because one of my friends wanted to give money and she and I didn't know how to do that. So I set, I just set it up and like, through word of mouth, we raised over $5,000 just from wow. people giving money for this. So like, uh, and I, that's way more than I expected. And we've, we've spent about half of that on things like bicycles, uh, food, um, furniture for them and stuff like that. But I mean, we have way, we have much more than we need. Um, and it's been amazing, like how much people have turned out for this. So it's, um, it's been, but it's been really fun. Like they, um, so I don't know how the transition's like, you'd have to ask them. I'm sure mm -hmm. that it's difficult. And I see the mother talking sure. to her husband. She, she talks to him every day. He doesn't have windows in his, they don't have windows in the apartment anymore. They use, they use like cellophane tape on all the windows and of a 60 unit apartment building, there's probably seven people left in that apartment building, including him. And he can't be near the windows. He has to, he has to basically be at the center of the building so towards the, the front of the, the entrance of the apartment at all times because uh you know at any time there could be a blast and that that's it yeah so he, t he looks after a few apartments for for some of the neighbors there are looters so it's not just war that they have to worry about or the enemy that they need to worry about they need to worry about looters they have to worry about ukrainian citizens who now have guns who don't have any training they they, they gave guns to everyone who wanted to fight they don't just have to worry about the, the enemy but anyway yeah i think it's been good the belgian government especially the local uh authority that basically city we, it's called a commune but it's a, it's a small city within the Br the brussels greater metropolitan area where we live they've already issued uh residence permits to the mother and the daughters the daughters are are, are already in school they're already in they're in the public school here so they're they're being educated in french so they're getting french uh training education they don't speak a word of french um but they but it's okay because mathematics they're good you know they it's that's a universal okay. language and they can follow along science they're half good you know, they know the concepts. They just need to understand what, what uh, some of the words mean. And then they're getting French, uh, you know, training, basically. French for foreigners. So, wow. um, yeah, yeah, it's really good. And they, they're in a, they're in a, uh, my school, which is the, which is the international school here. Uh, it has an after school program for Ukrainians that they are running so they can go there and play and meet, meet other Ukrainians. The older daughter is already in a basketball, on a basketball team. She likes basketball. So that's great. It's really oh, amazing. That is great. They're, they are transitioning. Yeah, and oh, the they challenges. have um, they have health insurance. Belgium has has national health insurance, and I know that that's a big debate in on both sides of the aisle in the United States. But um, it's not an issue here. Everyone has access to free health care, and it works. Well, I'm glad to hear that Kushia and her daughters are are doing well um, over there, <laughs> and that she's been able to be in contact with her husband daily. That's wonderful. Since opening your home to this family, is there anything that you've learned or discovered in this process? I've learned a lot about my limits of my temper limits, my patience. I mean, I'm human, you know, I lose my temper. I, I get upset. I, you know, if I want to use the bathroom, if I want to take a shower, I want to take a shower when I take a shower. But, uh, you know, we only have one shower and uh, I got to wait in line. I'm the only man in the house. No, it's it's great. I mean, we're all right. My our daughter is having the time of her life. She's three, and this is wonderful. She has two older sisters that take care of her and love her, which is great. Oh, that is wonderful. So you you already touched on this, but you created a fundraiser to help provide essentials to Cushy and her daughters. And you mentioned some of those items. Are is there anything else that's still needed? And if so, how no, can I, folks help? I mean, the so the fundraiser, uh, like PayPal limits it to a month and the month has already elapsed. So it, it's no longer in effect. But um, I mean, I, I have a PayPal, but we don't really need anything. I mean, if people wanted to, um, and this is literally just if people want to, we, I'm not asking for it. Um, it's I think 
you can go on PayPal and my at is, is at Max Rosser, M-A-X-R-O-S-S-E-R. And I think you could donate directly to me, but um, I'm, I, we don't need anything. We've already, we've already exceeded the goal of the original fundraiser and we've only spent about half of that. And the mother's already working. She works for this uh, missing children organization. I mean, it's half volunteering. She's basically getting paid just small amounts, but you know, she doesn't have to pay for rent or anything like that. So all of her income goes to, you know, paying for food and things like that. It's great. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't need anything. Well, we'll still include the link that you shared in okay. our show notes, but that's great to hear that all is well and you feel like they have everything they need. That's wonderful. So my last question, Max, you're currently enrolled in our teacher ready certification program and you are almost halfway through. How has the teacher ready work influenced your work at the international school? Well, I think it's given me a lot of the pedagogical underpinnings to what I have already been practicing in school. So my education was never an education. So I don't know education except from a practical standpoint. So now I kind of have a much better theoretical understanding of what's going on in the kids' brains in development and things like that, which I didn't have before, which is which is very useful. Um, Definitely. Also, yeah, last year was in the high school. This year I'm in the middle school, and they're just a totally different animal species of person. <laughs> I don't have experience with middle schoolers. Uh, so, so teacher ready's help. It's really helpful with that classroom management, behavior management, things like that. Well, I'm excited for you. Um, you want to be a general science teacher in biology. Correct. Yes. So my bachelor's degree is in biology and my, my master's is in environmental protection. So I, ideally I'll be teaching biology and general science at a high school, maybe at this school, if, if an opening, if something opens up or somewhere else in, in Europe, preferably for a couple of years, and then maybe we'll go back home to Virginia. Well, I'm very excited for you and we certainly wish you success and all the best in that. And I just want to thank you again for being on the show today, for sharing your story. And I just think it's awesome that Cushy and her daughters are staying with you guys during this very difficult time for them. And I'm just thank you for what you and your wife have done. Thank you. Given the same situation, I think a lot of people would do the same thing. It's, it, was, it was a no brainer. We had to do it. Thank you, Max for the contributions that you're making to this family. Your story is such an inspiration to all of us. Thank you from us all. We've got some events coming up, so we'd love to see you all there, as well as a free webinar as part of our Nine Principles in Action series. It's coming up next month. You can learn more and sign up by heading to studereducation.com slash events and clicking on the event on the right-hand side of the page. As always, I thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Performance. Please share this episode with a friend or colleague, and also your feedback is valuable to us. So please take a moment to follow and rate us on Apple Podcast. I look forward to connecting with you and hearing from you. So please let us know. Thank you again for tuning into this episode. And I look forward to connecting with you next time as we continue to focus on the nine principles for organizational excellence so that we can be our best at work. Have a great week, everyone.